Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate this great show of beautiful faces. Uh, <clears throat> I really would like to thank the uh, Valley Organic Growers Association and the Learning Council for making this happen. So kudos to you guys, gals, uh, and all the support there. And so tonight's subject, an interesting subject, regenerative agriculture. Uh, this is actually a fascinating international, worldwide movement. So I had to check it out. What does Wikipedia say? <laughs> regenerative agriculture is an approach to food and farming systems that regenerates topsoil and increases biodiversity now and long into the future. So this is huge. This is what we're going for. We're trying to increase this topsoil. We're, you know, this is increasing the health of our land, the fertility, the vitality. This is making an investment in, in your farm, in your future. If you have kids, if you want to pass this farm on to some, to you know the next generation, you know a lot of this farmland we see nowadays is worn out. It's been <clears throat> overplowed and overtilled and overfertilized, and um, we're losing extreme amounts of topsoil. But there are incredible, powerful techniques to regenerate the soil. And so tonight, we're going to go through some of these techniques. We're going to, I'm going to give you kind of like the, a quick shot of the best of what, what I know. Uh, there's, you know this, this subject of regenerative agriculture is a, is a large subject. It encompasses everything from permaculture to key line plowing and, and <coughs> agroforestry. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. It's, it's basically an overall topic uh, of how to generate fertility and health. And this is a topic that I'm serious about because what, what I'd like to see is a healthy future for my, for my kids and for my, uh, you know, for the, for the seven generations down the road. And we have these techniques and um, we have some powerful scientific data now backing up some of the work we've been doing here locally. Uh, one of the most... Um, <clears throat> There's a, there's a farming, ranching uh, test going on across Colorado. It's about 65, uh, everywhere from very conventional operations all the way to organic and biodynamic operations. And at the very top of that list is one of the farms I'm working with in Carbondale, sustainable settings. And they are seeing the soil data like going upwards like, like never seen before, like an increase of um, the humus, all the fertility, there's no other farm in the entire state of Colorado that's having uh, results like this. So this stuff really works. I've, I grew up in uh, western North Carolina in a little town, uh, town called Hendersonville. And Henderson County, it's a great spot. You know, it was actually, when, when, I, was, when I was born, there was, it was the 10th largest apple producing uh, county in the nation. So it produced, you know, there was, so there's tens of thousands of acres of uh, fruit trees there. So it's been a part of my, my livelihood and uh, I have a dear love for the trees and for the earth and for all of its inhabitants. And I found some powerful techniques uh, <clears throat> to bring health and vitality and restore this topsoil into the future. You know, this is what we're, this is what we're working on. So I just thought I'd show this because I found this one last year in one of our biodynamic fields and uh, I just wanted to bring a good dose of it. Good luck into this whole <laughs> evening. Lord knows I could probably use a little. And so I'm just going to jump right into a few of these um, few, few, few uh, really powerful tools we have. One of them, does anybody recognize this plant here? This is the oldest plant on the earth. This is Equisetum arvids. The horsetail herb. Extremely medicinal. This yeah, has more silica than any other plant on the entire planet. So if you were to burn this and the, the, the skeleton that's left is 90% silica. And silica is something we don't really pay attention to too much in agriculture, but this is the key, this is one of the keys to fertility. And, and what I'm gonna teach you guys tonight, this is fascinating. This is basically free or cheap. You know, this is like one of the cheapest, most inexpensive farming systems on the planet, you know, the regenerative agriculture. And we can go, you know, you can obviously go and spend a lot of money, but this horsetail herb grows all over this whole region, all along the ditches, easy to find. And there was a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Rudolf Steiner in 1924, he gave this series of uh, lectures called the Spiritual Foundations for the Renewal of Agriculture. And in that, um, he was basically the first person to point out that 
these chemical fertilizers, which were now becoming fashionable, are uh, destroying the topsoil and the health. And so he gave a number of remedies. Um, and I'll go through some of those tonight, but this is one he talked about a lot. And this one, he actually called it the antifungal remedy. So if you have a tomato blight uh, in your greenhouse, if you have a, you know, cannabis gets that mold on it and stuff, powdery mildew, all these issues are, are, a, are a big deal. And we, we're lucky here in this dry climate. But so, everybody, so he, he gave this as a, as a, as a tool to use to, to combat um, what he called excessive lunar forces. And when the lunar, the lunar, the, wa the, the lunar forces work really strongly through the watery element, right? You can see this at the high tides. And so he said when the lunar forces become too strong, they come out of the earth where they belong and they come up into the plants and they bloom into mushrooms and fungi and all this stuff. So he said if you spray the aquasium, this will bring those lunar forces back into the ground. It's a strange concept, but it works. It works really good. Um, but the modern research found out through uh, testing with the soil food web and the Lane Ingham's lab and some others has found that actually this is an incredible probiotic for your soil. So just like when you take probiotics for your gut and it makes your stomach happy, if you spray this onto your plants, you make a tea out of this and spray it on, this actually totally increases the soil uh, microbiology and it breeds beneficial fungi. And just so we know, you know, you know if we have more ben beneficial fungi, in, uh, <clears throat> if we have more beneficials in our gut, you know, we're gonna be happy. So those, this idea that we put this out and it actually increases the beneficial fungi, the soil food web. So if you use this tea, if you make a tea out of this and use this in your compost teas, you can actually get really high levels of beneficial fungus. And that's a lot harder to find. Usually you can, you know, you can easy to grow bacteria, but the, the fungal component is tricky. So, <clears throat> This one, we, we harvest it when it's uh, <clears throat> any time before June, July usually. And then we make a tea out of that, or a strong tea. And then you can use that fresh, works really good. Or you can uh, ferment it to where it gets, it's called the characteristic smell. And it stinks really bad, <laughs> really bad. So, uh, but once it's fermented, it is super strong, potent. Um, <clears throat> I use this for like almost in all my sprays, foliar sprays. I use it with all my other remedies. I use it in my compost teas. And this one, again, you can go collect this on the ditches. It's abundant, it grows everywhere, and highly recommended. One of the, one of the great tools of uh, regenerative agriculture here. All right, now this is a plant. This is a great plant too. So I'm just gonna go through some of these medicinal plants because these are the ones we really like to use. These are ones we can grow. Does anybody recognize this plant? Valerian. Yeah, it's valerian. Valerian officinalis. What a beautiful, beautiful plant. It has big hollow stems, and we get this bloom. And <clears throat> what we do is actually, instead, you know, medicinally, we use the root generally for valerian. But here we're using the flower. Here's one of our wonderful uh, Voga board members uh, harvesting valerian. Look at this beautiful patch. It's, it's really strong, uh, absolutely gorgeous patch of valerian there. And what we do with this then is we harvest these flowers. And we're going to press the juice. So here we are. This is a picture of just uh, grinding it up. And you can see, kind of see on the bottom there, it's coming out as a juice. And then we're going to press that and we're going to collect this juice. This, this is the remedy for phosphorus. So, you know, like most people buy phosphorus, the colloidal rock phosphate. We know that in agriculture, phosphorus as in general is running out. It's, the, you know, they say there's maybe a 10 to 15 year supply of phosphorus left on the planet in agriculture. So this is an incredible remedy you can use. It says, what it says in here is that uh, in the, as Steiner had, had mentioned that this will help the plants relate in the right way to phosphorus. So we use that. Um, so what we do is actually make like, a, it's almost like a wine. We're pressing that juice and you can see the solids collecting there. We put the fermentation lock on the top. And then we use this highly diluted. So think about a tincture, tincture dropper full. It's about 21 drops. That's over an acre. <clears throat> we use that <clears throat> to get chairs. Frost protection, this is our frost protection um, remedy. And maybe we could just hold the questions till the end there. <clears throat> uh, but this one we use um, as a foliar spray on cold nights when the plants are in bloom. And <clears throat> we, you know, we, we have these late frosts, it's always an issue here. And, and this, actually, if you spray this out, you want to dilute this in warm water, stir it up and spray it out, this will actually give you about five degrees of frost protection. 
fascinating. You want to use warm water, ideally you get it out the night before the frost, the freeze. Um, but, you know, there was very few people had cherries last year, but a few of the farms that I worked on sprayed, they actually had really beautiful cherries. So, I'm going to just like, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and step out on a, maybe a short plank for just a minute, but these also, you know, these, these, uh, these planets, since ancient times, have been related to different uh, bodies of the, the cosmic body. So Saturn actually is a planet that's related to Valerian. Here's the uh, soul of the, the Aurora Borealis on Saturn's North Pole. Absolutely fascinating, but <clears throat> these preparations, these, uh, like the Valerian, um, actually can help tune, you know, these, these different remedies will tune your plants to the bigger cosmic surrounding to uh, <clears throat> bring all that information into your soil. So the Valerian preparation, I love. I would highly recommend using that. It's, it's easy, it's, it's uh, again, super economical, and it helps the, the plants relate to phosphorus in the right way. And, and I had that in, interesting uh, happen last year. I, I was spraying over at Jeff's, Jeff at Delicious Orchards, and I, I was spraying a valerian for frost protection one night on, the, on, the, um, on his cherries, <clears throat> and actually my sprayer, I'm a pretty big sprayer, it's like 120 gallons, but somehow one of the hoses came off and all this valerian juice just, I mean, this valerian, it just went everywhere. It just like laid down this huge strip right down the cherries and usually takes me about a half an hour to get all the spray out. But I, uh, I, I realized, you know, those plants were so happy and, we, and, and then I started, you know, thinking about this whole relationship with phosphorus and, you know, then I found the soil tests, finally got all these soil tests and done on these fields around here and we had like, zero phosphorus in the soil almost. I mean, it was almost minuscule, like two parts per million phosphorus. So those cherries looked incredibly beautiful, and I think that valerian help really helped to bring in that phosphorus energy. Now this is another, everybody recognizes this one. This is what Steiner, he, he called this the, the innocent little yellow dandelion. And it is such an innocent plant, right? And think about what happens on this planet with this, you know, how much war has gone on against this pure little innocent dandelion. <sighs> but you think, oh, Carbondale, gosh, those guys, they even have dandelion days. They love it. So this plant is one of the remedies we use for uh, higher yields. So if you want to increase your yields, you use this plant. This one's related to Jupiter. The Jupiter is like the planet of abundance. It's a big planet. So we actually, you can make teas out of all these. There's other ways to use these into making uh, remedies <clears throat> that we make. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of uh, Enzo Nastati. And this is, he's got some fascinating work with the, uh, the homeo homeopathic aspects of, of agriculture. Absolutely fascinating. So... He's actually helping us to develop new ways of even dilute, you know, using minuscule amounts and having potent effects. So this is one we can potentize. This is one that Steiner had said this, the soils are losing their ability to, um, <clears throat> to be abundant, to be fruitful. And he said using a dandelion preparation will really help with that. So, this is one of my favorites. This is another cheap, easy remedy. Steaming nettle. And nettle, uh, if you can see there on the bottom of the screen, you see these like these stingers. You know, absolutely fascinating. This, this has this formic acid, this oxalic acid in the sting. It's the same thing. It's like one of the only plants that has something of that uh, astral insect quality in it, right? It's the same thing that's in the bee sting or the ant bite, that, that acid. And so we, can, we make remedies out of this. This is one that um, we, we should probably be using a lot more of. This is probably the most effective of all the remedies I've made, is the, is the nettle preparation. Um, and you can make a tea out of this also. We know how good this is for us. Um, internally as medicine, and especially for pregnant women, the, this, <clears throat> so this plant, Steiner actually said it should be growing all around our hearts. And what he meant is that, you know, growing this on our farms to use as fertility booster because this has all, you know, the full spectrum of minerals, nitrogen. And if you want to have really healthy plants, you can make a tea of this and spray it on, and it's incredible. You can spray this on your vines, on your whatever you're growing. This makes everything happier. So I like to go way up high. This is about uh, 11 or 12,000 feet, and you can see the 
see the uh, nettles blooming there, and I'll collect those in super high medicinal qualities in those plants. And then we love making a tea out of this. So this is a ferment, so you can get a big barrel and you can just keep adding water and keep adding nettles. And it gets stinky too, but you dilute this with water, spray it out. This is cheapest, best fertilizer on the planet right here. So that's not economical. One of the, in, in the biodynamic method, we use the nettles and we actually chop them up like this. And then we pound them. We pound and pound and pound. And we put these in these nettle tiles and actually spend a whole year in the ground. And when this product comes out, we use about a, about a teaspoon of it per, per acre. Uh, and and um, yeah, Steiner again, he mentioned that this will make your plants more intelligent. Actually, and it's like an infusion of intelligence for your soil. Think about that for a minute. That's interesting. This was an interesting little experiment I was doing with different ways of burying these nettles. Uh, here's another way, you can see on the bottom, that's actually a, a mesh green, fiberglass mesh green on the top, we have different terracotta tiles that are pounded, and then we'll bury that, and that'll stay in the ground for a whole year. Another one we use, um, not the best picture, but this is the oak, and you know we obviously have lots of oaks around here. Oaks, oak is such a majestic tree. What a beautiful, uh, what a beautiful plant to, to hang out with, you know, and so we actually use the oak bark, and this plant has more calcium almost than any other plant on earth. And so this is the one we use for plant disease. This is, uh, you're using the outer layer of the oak bark so you never scrape off the inner layer. You don't, you don't ever damage the tree itself. You're just getting that outer layer. And this is, <coughs> Steiner said this is our universal remedy for plant diseases. He said, you know, it's a lot harder to cure human diseases and animal diseases, but we can have a universal remedy, and that's the oak bark. And this, again, has and a huge amount of calcium, and you're also getting the energetic quality of oak, which is, uh, you know, makes your plants strong, gives them, the, gives, them, gives them an uprightness. Very wonderful thing. I um, thought we'd talk a minute about the cow, because the cow is one of the greatest generators of fertility on the planet. And we know from the cow, the bovine, it is the only animal pretty much on the planet that fertilizes twice the area that it eats off of. So if it eats off an acre, the amount of manure it produces can fertilize two acres. So this, this, is, a, this is a giver. Um, it's, it, you know, the cow's like the ultimate, or somebody wrote this, it's like the ultimate be beast of digestion. You know, and you think about all these animals and what they're doing, you know, horses are really good at running, and chickens are great at laying eggs, and dogs and good be a man's best friends, and cats are, Definitely great at being cats. Uh, <laughs> but what is the cow good for? It's good for digestion, you know? It's just like it's eight hours a day it's eating grass. And eight hours a day it's chewing that cud and regurgitating and, and thinking, you know, med it's almost like this meditation process. It's actually, you know, what does the soil need here? It actually can tune its digestion to your to your particular farm if you have deficiencies. The cows can actually eat that, and in that rumination process, they're thinking, feeling. Um, and then it goes through this huge digestion process. And if you took this, this uh, internal organs of the, uh, the digestive system of the cow, and you stretch it out, it's the longest digestive tract of all the mammals. It's over half the length of the football field. So it's a huge digestion system. It has four stomachs. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Hugo Herbe, who, who came up with his own remedies, fascinating fellow, but he, he, in his book he writes about the cow, he says, um, the quadruple stomach of the cow is the site of the most comprehensive cosmic alchemy on earth. Well, there's a serious alchemical process going on here, this transformation of grass into this incredible fertile manure. So in, in, the, in the regenerative agriculture, the animals play a big part in bringing in this fertility. It's, this, is a, this is something vitally important to us. And I started thinking about this in relation to our area. You know, we really don't see those phosphorus deficiencies so bad. You know, our plants are still pretty healthy in, in general in this area. And I think all these animal manures contain lots of phosphorus. So thank God we have all the wild beasts running around and whatnot. But it's very important to use this cow manure. Um, one of the, this is one we like to make. We're actually, I just talked to Jeff at Delicious Orchard. We're going to make some more of this. We had a great workshop with the Learning Council 
um, in Voga last year over at uh, over Delicious Orchards. We made some of the spray and uh, we had really great results. It was beautiful stuff. But we, we use this this uh, special, this is a this is like the most highly concentrated, powerful compost on earth that we make here. This is called barrel compost, and this is just a basic recipe. So you're using about about 12 and a half gallons of manure, and it's about a, it's about a quart of uh, ground basalt rock. We have lots of basalt powder rock around here, luckily. Um, <clears throat> you can use other rocks in there, but and then the eggshells, about a cup of those. And then we add these different, the yarrow, the chamomile, the oak, the nettle, dandelion, the valerian. And what we're doing here, this is one of I've just, we were over in uh, Utah recently teaching, and we made this as the first start of a pit, and we're, we're uh, you know, this is bringing this out into the desert. So the original shape was a barrel, they were using wine barrels, but since we don't have access to those so easy, and they kind of rot out after a few years, we, we, use, we like to use brick, there's other ways to do it. Um, here's one we made over in uh, Boulder, and this is aspen logs. This is one of Enzo's and uh, Nastati's indications of using the aspen as a, as a tree that relates really strongly to the lunar forces. Uh, so you can see you can do a variety of different things. This one, this is another pit we made square. This, is, this was absolutely like beautiful. This was me made in Carbondale, and I made this, and it came out to like some of the most beautiful compost in the world. I was like, oh. This is a treasure. And then I came back, and, and like about three weeks later, I had a class I was teaching over there, and I said, guys, I cannot wait to show you this amazing compost that we made. So I took the whole class over there. We got there, and the, uh, I guess they call them whistle pigs. The whistle pigs completely like filled this whole thing over, and like that was completely destroyed and gone. And they had just, it was, it was such a moment of, you know, Three weeks, this, this, this is like thousands of dollars worth of stuff. I mean, you use a, use a stuff a quarter cup or a third of a cup per acre, so it's a tiny amount. But do you know what they originally came up with this for? 1945, that time period, what were they doing? They were going around, they had great ideas. Take these atomic bombs, blow them up in the atmosphere to test them, right? So this is that, that time period in there. And what was happening is this nuclear radiation was having fallout all over the planet. It got in a jet stream. So there was these a few farmers who got together and said, you know, what can we do about this? Can we do anything? So they came up, they actually tested all these different remedies, and they found out that the basalt, the eggshells, and the cow manure combined together provided an incredibly effective remedy for uh, nuclear radiation. So we know, I mean, Fukushima is still seeping over uh, nuclear radiation. We live in a radioactive area. This is very good stuff. They found out the farms that were using this after Chernobyl, fascinating. The farms that were, uh, were using this on one side of the fence, that they, they were testing the milk because you couldn't sell your milk if it had radiation in it. So the farms that were using this barrel compost had no radiation in their milk. And right across the, right where, like right the fence line, the kais across the, across the way, they couldn't sell their milk because they had radiation in it. So, this is one that we can use, and this is the, I call it like the jack of all trades, or the, uh, the ultimate booster. We use this for drought, we use this when there's too much rain, we use this when there's, uh, when we've had like a big windstorm or a hailstorm to help plants recover. And so this just gets stirred in water and sprayed out. I'll show you some, something interesting here. This is a couple pits we made um, up on Landboard Mesa. And here we go, We're, this is the, um, this is the manure after it's been stirred, and we're inserting our different uh, biodynamic remedies in there. And we'll soak the burlap and put that on top. And about three months later, this is a cold fermentation. We're starting to get some transformation in here. And look at that. This was fascinating. Because this was the first time I'd had mushroom bloom like this in my barrel compost. And Something else happened that time. It was the first time I actually used the equisetum in my barrel compost. Wow. So remember I was talking about boosting this beneficial, yeah. beneficials? This is what happened. You know, so this, you can imagine, once this is done, you take this and spray this out as a foliar feed. And again, you can use it for pretty much any issues you have. If you want to start plants with it, water them in, if you want really healthy, strong plants, use this. Um, <clears throat> Use that, you know, you, you can use this pretty much all throughout the year. Um, this is what happens if you're that guy that just lets your barrel compost sit in there for a couple weeks too long. 
Uh, somehow these roots from far away just love to get into stuff and just eat all that juice open. So that barrel compost pit, about 2,000 acres worth of manure was just seemingly disappeared. That was, that's on me. <laughs> these are the different, these are the nine we call biodynamic preparations. So we use, one has the manure, one has the silica, and then we have these medicinal herbs. Um, I'm going to get into just um, to silica preparation for a second. And what we do uh, in this one is we take quartz crystals of different sorts or rock minerals that contains a high amount of silica and we crush them. So you can see that's actually a, a T-post pounder flipped upside down. And then we have one of those big pounding bars and we take these beautiful quartz crystals. And you can use milky quartz. We've used all kinds of stuff. We've used pure Brazilian John of God quartz and we've used... That's some how potent stuff. Um, we've used, uh, you know, perfect gem quality. We've used amethyst, rose quartz, um, all sorts of quartz. And so I have a whole collection of these I've been making. But this one, we crush it up. Okay, this is, this is another one that was going on the wind. This is kind of gets strange in here. But we make, a, we make a paste out of it. And then we, and then we, the nest actually goes into cow horns. And it spends the summer underground. So you can see, um, here are these different colored tapes. There's about 12 different types of rock minerals in here being charged up. And so what this, what's happening is like, this is actually like a, uh, a charging process where this, <coughs> this, um, this, you know, the sun's energy is coming into the earth through the summer. And this, these cow horns are somehow absorbing that. And so when you use this stuff, you're using about a, um, a teaspoon or much less even over an acre. It's, it's a tiny microscopic amount, but what this does is, is, is it's a huge infusion of photosynthesis, plant metabolism, um, all that is, you know, the plants are really stimulated above, and it stimulates everything that's going on above ground. So it's almost like an atmospheric fertilizer. And I think I have a picture here. Yeah, this is over a delicious orchard, and you can see the, the peaches there. This is one of my favorite things to do is, is, is make rainbows. Uh, so this is important here, though, that the silica actually comes up as a uh, super fine, fine mist spray. So it's actually just getting in the atmosphere. And so what's going to happen now that these peaches have been sprayed is you're going to have a stronger, um, stronger stem structure, cell structure, but this will increase the flavor, the taste, the keeping qualities. This, these peaches will last a lot longer just after a couple, one or two sprays of this, instead of them going, you know, going. Uh, ripe really quickly. <clears throat> this spray can actually bring, um, uh, you know, medicinal herbs, the uh, essential oil quantities, qualities. Uh, if anybody's out there growing, you know, wine, if you start to see what's happening in the wine world, all the top vineyards almost across the entire planet now have gone biodynamic. And they're using this preparation. This will increase your bricks overnight by spraying your, your uh, the sugar quant content to raise it overnight by several points. So this, um, <clears throat> this is a highly effective spray, uh, very economical. You want to spray it early in the morning because you can actually burn your plants. I've, I've burned tomatoes and whatnot. Um, I like to use this one starting in May, May, June, all the way through October. There's a picture of me out there spraying one of those uh, cow pastures. And you can see it's fascinating, you know, this is one of the manure preparations, but those cows are very interested. I mean, they've been following me around the whole time. I had to get out of the truck and take a picture of it because they love this so much. So what you'll see after you do these sprays, you know, all of a sudden, I was talking to one of these farmers. I've been spraying them um, uh, in really rough soil. But he says, now, you know, my tractor actually glides the soil where before it was really having a hard time. So, so by using these, these remedies, we can really increase the health, fertility, uh, the humus quality and quantity, the earthworms, all that. Oh, this is fun. These lovely ladies of the biodynamic world. They, this is another one of those strange biodynamic remedies. But you remember I was telling you about this cow manure. <clears throat> well, we have a way of enhancing this cow manure exponentially. And this is stuffing it into a cow horn. So this is actually pre-stirred. We uh, stuff it into horns and then we, we like to uh, enlist child labor and do such sort of things. Uh, and we actually get buried over, and this is actually a beautiful little 
demonstration here, but so these, these uh, when this manure comes out of this horn, it's super potent. It's alive. It has uh, an incredible amount of uh, bacteria, fungi. The whole soil food web is really enlivened here. Um, and it's potent. You use, a, you use a quarter cup of this per acre. And this is, this is going to be the opposite of the horn silica. So this is stimulating everything that's going on in the earth. So your roots will be bigger, will have a bigger root system. You kind of have uh, the, uh, uh, very much an increase of in humus. Topsoil, we were talking about regenerating that topsoil. This brings, uh, this, this remedy right here will, will actually increase the organic matter exponentially. And in areas like Australia, now there's like a, over 2 million acres under biodynamic cultivation. It's really big there. It's still barely known over here. But they use that. And they've developed over the past, like in 10 years, they're showing places went from desert to 3 feet of topsoil. So we've had yet to have those kind of results here. But we're working on it. I have a few more horny pictures here for you, just so you can see them. And there's getting into the pit, and we, we reuse these. So this is, goes in the ground in the fall, dug up in the spring. And what's going on, you know, that time of year is that the earth in the fall is big and hail, right? All this energy, you can see it in the leaves and all the energetic qualities going into the earth. And all that information from the summer is going into the earth and it's all being stored, you know, and, and it's this resting period, but it's also, it's the opposite of what you might think, but the earth is most inwardly alive then. It's the earth, it's inside of the earth is alive. And then in spring, this exhale, and you see it in the plant, you can see it right now, the crocuses and the, and the tips of the leaves are starting to, you know, the buds are swelling and all that energy goes out. You know, and it goes out into the earth, and then, you know, midsummer, it's, it's a standstill, and then we do the cycle. So what we're doing is we're capturing that energy, all that information from the whole summer, you know, and it, and it goes into this manure, and it gets sprayed out. This is not just like on a the physical, you know, you can also look at this in num numerous ways as a physical um, agent of uh, <clears throat> producing health, but there's also energetic qualities, too. Many energetic qualities we don't really have time to get into tonight, but this is uh, one of those horns being uh, dug out of the earth, and you can see this beautiful, beautiful fungal bloom on here. And so this is the indigenous microorganisms from your land. You're actually increasing those dramatically. You know, so we're ba basically in this receptacle, you, you have a vessel to, to collect and inoculate indigenous microorganisms, which are the ones that have grown here through you know, time immortal and develop specifically on your farm or on your, in your region. And so we actually take this and we stir it up. You can see there's a root in there. And roots love to get in there. We, we, we try to make our pits like, okay, those trees are way over there. Let's get, get it away. And somehow, they always come back. Uh, the roots just always love to get in there. This is, uh, this is one of the horns. And you can see, again, this is that be beautiful bloom of the uh, beneficial uh, fungi here. And this is stuff you can use in your, in your uh, compost teas as a foliar spray. And this is something fascinating I found with these horns. Uh, if you can see there on the very tip of that, up, up on the index finger there, what those roots are doing. And they kind of find this and they go and they get to the very end of that, that tip of that horn on the inside. And they just they stop. They don't like go and they turn around. They just all go and they just stop. And there was an interesting... Uh, book, but he talks about how the, the horn is actually similar to the, the cochlea, the, the ear hammer, the, you know, in our, in our ear. It's a, like a listening device that the cows have in a way. So, so when you put these back into the earth, like, it's almost like the earth listening. So, so it's fascinating to see these roots. And lo and behold, if you leave a horn in the ground, this is an accident. I was dug all these horns up, right, and missed one. And this on the bottom, we're seeing roots. And what happened is they all Every single one of those tips are at the end. They like all went to that point, and all I pulled out the manure is completely gone. But the trees are so interested in what's going on in there. So this one is incredible, though, because if you start using this, you will start to notice a big difference in your soils, in in the population of your earthworms, and the overall health of your uh, <clears throat> of your land, uh, of the um, you know, kind of like that sponge factory, you know, your soil will start to get more spongy and start to become alive, aerated. So this is, this is really powerful for, for the life of the soil. There's another one of those roots. All right, so we, 
what we do in biodynamics too is, is how now we want to take these remedies and, and uh, use them. So the vortex, this, this image right here of this, of this vortex, and where have we seen this before? You know, you think about a hurricane, a bathroom. <laughs> we could see this in uh, the movement of stars, of spiral galaxies, of how ferns unravel, of every single movement in the, you know, pretty much entire, you know, nature is happening in the spiral motion. So we can actually take these different remedies we make and increase their, their efficacy, their potentization by adding them to the water. And this water actually carries, becomes the carrier of these energetic qualities of these different remedies we make out there. So this is a, just an example of storing the, these, this, the, the barrel compost or the manure. Um, <clears throat> we want to store it with uh, peat moss around them. And the peat moss is something fascinating. I heard the story recently of, uh, I think it was like in Ireland, we were somewhere over there with the big peat bogs. There was a dead body found, and they, you know, they got all the police, and it looked like a fresh, you know, this is such as just happened, right? This dead body was in there, and the cave in the peat bogs, and lo and behold, they, 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 the forensic scientists came out, and they said, "Gosh, this has happened over a hundred years ago. Wow. How is it possible?" And so this peat has this keeping quality, so it's keeping these <clears throat> these, these energetic qualities that we're putting, making in different remedies. It's holding it, so it's very important to keep the peat moss around. So this is one of the devices I have for stirring the biodynamic preparations. This is actually stirs about 60 gallons at a time. So usually you do about three gallons in an acre. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful vortex you can see created here. And this is actually run by hydraulics, so there's, um, there's no interference with electromagnetic fields or anything like that. It's all the in motors parked far away. And, um, this is how I get out there and I stir and then I'll go spray farms. This is another one, um, just looking at it from the top. And I wanted to mention this picture in particular because this is another remedy. It's not real. this is a regenerative remedy we use. Um, and this is the milk and honey spray. So, if we can all go back in our mind, the biblical land of milk and honey, where everything flows and it's all abundant and healthy. So, this, uh, one of my teachers actually came up with this remedy, and it was, it was because of an insect attack on these fruit trees. And what he found was, <clears throat> you know, he's trying to come up with a way to get rid of these insects, and he sprayed, he came up with this milk and honey spray. And you spray that on, and you're using about 10 parts of um, milk and one part honey and about 100 parts water. So it's about a 1 to 10, 1 to 10, 1 to 10 ratio, <coughs> a dilution. And you stir that up and spray it out. And that's totally, by the next day after spraying this, all those insects were gone. And they were replaced with beneficial insects. And I've seen this numerous times. So if you have insect infestation, which is always an issue with aphids and other stuff, you can spray this milk and honey. That's a cheap and easy remedy. Um, even powdered milk works, lo and behold. But, and, and you know, you can look at modern science now. They, they know that these, these milk uh, dairy sprays, you spray this on the field, it's definitely going to increase the biological life in the soil. So, <clears throat> I do like to think of the biblical map land of milk and honey when I'm spraying this out because there's definitely, a, you know, another energetic quality. You can feel this when you spray it out too. There's another, this is one of the copper stirring machines I made, actually, and this one is out. I, I made this and, uh, with the help of uh, my friend Wesley, and we sent this out to a, uh, a big farm out in California. They're using this to stir up all their remedies now and spray it out. And you can see we even embossed the uh, signs of the zodiac in the top of there. So this is pretty cool. He's a, he's a pretty happy client there. Um, I'm just going to say this real quick. There is certification for biodynamics, and it's actually, if you look, um, it's the most stringent standards in the entire planet. No, it's the more, it's, it's um, pretty high standards, what you have to do, but <clears throat> what's happening with biodynamic certification is, uh, it's kind of now in the marketplace, it's known as the highest quality standard, you know, organic standards have kind of been somewhat watered down even in recent times with the whole uh, allowing of aquaculture and other things like that. The, you know, there's, so there's um, a certification behind this, and what's fascinating is if you get the certification, you're, 
looking at increasing your profits dramatically because if you think about this, organic or conventional prices, right, are where they're at. The organic prices are about 30% higher, right? Certified organic produce and, and um, you know, what's produced organically is about 30% higher than, than the conventional prices. Well, if you get certified biodynamics, you're looking at another 30% increase in your profits. So financially, I mean, what if I was to tell you you can increase your profits by 30% in, you know, in about two years' time without, with adding very little, you know, very little investment. But if you're a big fruit farmer, that could be huge. That could be significant. So this is something I just wanted you guys to be aware of. This is, I've worked, we have, an, um, we have a few Demeter uh, Biodynamic Certified Farms here in the Valley. We have a certified uh, hemp farm, Biodynamic Organic and Biodynamic Certified Hemp Farm. Um, in Hotchkiss, there's uh, Carol Schatz and her uh, Lavender Farm, Certified Biodynamic over in Carbondale. There's, um, if in Carbondale, there's, um, there's sustainable settings, they're certified biodynamics, and then there is um, Jackrabbit Hill Peak Spirits up on Redlands Mesa, who is, has incredible, uh, I don't know if you guys ever had, the, had his gin, or I mean, he might, might, might be drinking a gin and tonic out there right now with his biodynamic gin, in it, but he makes vodkas, brandies, all kinds of good stuff. Okay, well, we went through a few of those. I want to, didn't want to go on too long tonight, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, Luna, the moon, and how that might play into this, this whole paradigm of regenerative agriculture. So, now we know, it's pretty easy to know that the sun has an influence on plant growth. We can see that through the season. And, you know, if you look at, start looking at the traditional Hawaiian, agriculture, Chinese, or the Korean, or um, you know, Native American, or pretty much most of the agricultures that are like indigenous agricultures, they pay attention to the moon, and where the moon's at, and what's the moon doing. This is important to pay attention to if we wanna, if we wanna harness the beneficial effects of the moon. And if you wanna have the most beneficial effects, you, you would use some of these remedies that I just talked about, because that's gonna enliven your soils to become more receptive to this. So one of, the, one of the things we do in biodynamics is making sure we plant with the moon. And there's about, actually there's like nine rhythms within the moon that we pay attention to. So we're definitely not going to get into all of those tonight. But um, one, of the, one of the new moon, full moon, good to pay attention to. But if you want to look at starting seeds, best time to start your seeds is about two to four days before the full moon. And if you think about what happens... Um, in the tides around the full moon, right? All that water's coming up and you have the highest tides right at the full moon. Well, the same thing in the earth, this water is like moving. And the same thing with your plants. If you plant your seeds, you know, they can catch this wave of this energy that's coming up and they can sprout, you know, super quick and you can have really healthy plants. And it's fascinating. You can wait like two days after the moon, full moon. And you might have like a week before it germinates. It's gonna take a long time. Plants are never gonna be as healthy. So if catching that, you know, in your seeding two to, day, two to four days before the full moon, Extremely beneficial. <clears throat> There's also times that are detrimental for plant growth, and including an eclipse. This is a beautiful picture of a solar eclipse there, a lunar eclipse. And we have the, uh, <clears throat> what happens, you know, at that point is it's, it's something fascinating is, uh, you know, there's this quality coming in from the sun that's given us life to the earth, and then that moon comes right in front of it and just blocks that energy, right? So they found through all these, these plant trials, every time if you plant right around the, these eclipses, plants never do well then. They always usually have insect attacks, they're weak, they get disease. So there's very beneficial times, and then there's detrimental times to pay attention to. There's a biodynamic calendar. I was going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but this will tell you the best times when to plant and when not. There's good days and there's not so good days. So this is an uh, archetypical imagination. We can think about, you know, since ancient times, there was, we know about the four elements, right? The earth, air, fire, and water. Well, those also relate to the four parts of the plant or the four main organs of the plant. So the four main organs of the plants would be the root, the leaf, leaf stem, and then the flower, and then the fruit or the seed. And so, when in, in, our, in our regenerative agriculture terms, in biodynamic terms, what we're looking at then 
would be, um, what is the end goal of what we're trying to grow, right? So if we're trying to grow a tomato, what element are you really wanting to work with here? Probably the, the fire element. Or if you're trying to grow calendulas or maybe even cannabis, you might want to really work strongly with the air element, that flower organ, because in the end goal, you want the, uh, you want the highest quality flower. Or if you're growing leaf and kale, you know, that's, a, that's definitely a water, you know, the water, most watery part of the plant is in the leaf. You think about in, uh, in aquaculture, in, in aquaponics, mostly they, a lot of the stuff they grow is, is lettuce because lettuce is, loves the water. It just grows right in the water really well. So, and then there's the uh, earth. So if you're going for a root, you know, potatoes. So this has, this is like, when, when are you planting your potatoes? When are you harvesting your potatoes? Which element is dominant? So you guys have probably picked peaches or some squash randomly, and they've lasted like a really long time, and they're really beautiful. And then you probably pick some squash or peaches or tomato, and they kind of rot right away. So if you start looking, what element was dominant that day? If it was a water element, it's going to be really watery. So there's, a, there's an app actually on the iPhone you can get, when does wine taste best? And it's fascinating. They always, they've done these blind studies. Um, and they found that always on the fruit days, when the, when the moon's in a water sign, or the fruit, a fire sign, wine tastes way better. If you drink it during a, uh, a, wa a water sign, that's not so good necessarily. So um, there's another fascinating test they were doing in the, in the biodynamic world was they were lining up about 10 different wines, all from the same region, conventional, organic, and biodynamics, and, but all the same type of, type of uh, grape, all from the same region. And they did blind testings, and nine times out of ten, repeatedly, the biodynamic wines always went out over their organic and conventional counterparts. And I think this has a lot to do with paying attention to these rhythms here. <clears throat> so, okay, we're going to go far out. So we were at the moon, but there's also... Now, we know about the signs of the zodiac, right, from reading our newspaper astrology. <laughs> Or, but no, everybody in here, right, we're all born under certain signs. So, I was born with a Libra sun, a Libra moon, a Libra mercury, and a Libra Pluto. But uh, I was also born right in the cusp of Scorpio, so I still have some of that energy in me, too. But you know, like, you know, you know about those people who are Tauruses, and they're like, these, you know, they can make stuff happen. Or you know the Sagittarians, they can just, like, cut right through you, right to the chase, you know, like, put through your soul. Or there's, you know, everybody, the Leos, they're, you know, all these different qualities. Well... This was a science that, that the ancient ones came up with. They looked out into the starry heavens and they said, what's going on here? And they, and they divided the heavens up into these different uh, beings. You know, it's the zodiac stands for the, the animal circle. So it's, it's the circle of life that's going around. And so it's basically that middle plane that you see going in that circle on the outside. That's the, that's the ecliptic here. Um, maybe you can do this. Let's see. So this line here, this is the ecliptic. And this is the path of the sun. And that path, of, that's a little crooked there, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so the path of the sun, it, you know, basically, the sun is, rises in the east, sets in the west. We all know that. The planets all rise. The moon rises in that direction and set. And so the sun has this specific path. And then on about seven degrees on either side of this path of the sun, is the path where all of the other planets travel. And they all follow the path of the sun, but they're slightly different. And only when they cross that ecliptic in that seven degrees is when um, eclipses can occur. So, so there's this animal circle, and, and since, since long ago, um, these also have been related to the four elements, right? They have all the different, uh, like believers in air sign, Taurus, you know, it'll be an, Earth sign. Well, this is fascinating. Take, a, take a, just a mental image of this for a minute. And you see that there's the 12 constellations of the zodiac, and they're all, again, for thousands of years now, they've been related to these different elements, so this is nothing new. You know, this is an old science. This is, but this is fascinating. You see these, these triangulations. And so as the, as the sun's traveling this path, it's you know, it's been in about a month in each one of these constellations. It's in a 
earth sign, and it's in the flower sign, water sign, warm sign. And so the moon, though, is making this happen a lot quicker, too. So this moon's about in one of these different constellations every three days, it's moving to a different constellation. So this is an energetic imprint that's going on in the stars that you could actually imprint into your plants. If you want to have a good, healthy um, potato crop, you're probably going to plant when the moon's in the earth sign, and you're going to harvest when the moon's in the earth sign, and whatnot. <clears throat> so you can combine all those together, and you get an imagination of, the, of, the, of this energetic quality of the different uh, constellations. And so what they found, this lady, wonderful lady, she's not with us anymore, named Maria Thun. This calendar is based on her work. She was in Germany. Um, and she had this task given her by Rudolf Steiner to find out if, if, if she can identify the, uh, any effects of, that's coming in from the cosmic rhythms. So she set up these trials, and these trials went on for over 40 years. We planted radish seeds every hour on the hour for 40 years and saw what happened. Why did it choose radish? Radish is like one of those plants that goes from seed to seed really quickly, like within a month, right? It goes, grows up, and does its thing. And so sometimes she planted and she found these beautiful radishes, beautiful radishes with like, you know, perfect flavor and nice character. And sometimes she found these radishes that like had a lot of leaves on them. Or sometimes they'd find they'd be all cracked and they'd go shoot up the seed really quickly. And so she started doing these trials, you know, over the years and finding when do plants um, do best, what parts, you know, so that doesn't, so she developed a whole science with this biodynamic planting calendar of when to do what. And so <clears throat> she definitely found like when the, that organ of whatever sign the moon was in, <laughs> was dominant when they planted. So if they if if it was a fruit if it was planted during a fire sign, a fruit sign, you would definitely shoot up the seed a lot quicker than uh, any other time. Uh, <clears throat> she plant you know earth signs were excellent, excellent times for planting the radish. And then there was all time and there was sometimes when plants are really bad. And those are identified in this calendar too because we need to know those things, right? We should, hopefully. So this is, uh, you know, if you get a, a visual imagination now, this is what the, the this planting calendar looks like, sort of. And you can, this is a geocentric calendar, so it's Earth-centered, not heliocentric, not, not, not the sun at the center of the universe, but here we are, as human beings on this beautiful Earth, looking out into the starry heavens. This is the center of our universe right here where we're at, right? So this, is, this calendar is based on this perspective that we have from Earth. And you can see the signs of the zodiac in the center there. And that's what we all know from our common astrology that we look at, um, you know, in our, in our, again, like our newspaper astrology, the perfect 30 degree angles of all the. Um, but this was about set about 2,000 years ago. But there's something that's happening. It's called the precession of the equinoxes, where this is all moving about one degree every 72 years. So this whole thing is actually shifted. So um, we're. It's, it's moved almost the whole zodiac sign in the last several thousand years from what we're used to looking at in our um, astrology, astronomy. And so, and you can also see here that the constellations are different sizes. What's that all about? Well, if you can look here, if you can imagine when we look out at the, at the constellation of Libra, it's, it's this many stars. You know, from one side to the other, it takes up about 21 degrees, not 30 degrees. But then you look at Taurus or Virgo, there's these really big signs, right? And so from where the star actually starts to where they end. So you can look over here, say at, um, you know, the fishes, it's all the way here where the watermen, it's this little sign right here. You know, and you've got scales, again, it's really little, but if you go over to these earth sign of Virgo, look, it goes all. Way here, and this is how big this constellation is from this side of the constellation to this side. So that is why oops, we, um, in our calendar, you know, we use this constellational makeup. And so this is what the the, the sun is traveling from these constellations in about thirty days out of the year. In one of these constellations, three hundred sixty days, it takes around to get around. But the moon's going around this, and it's happening like every three days. Three to four days, two to three days. 
So there's an influence every two to three, four days that's coming in from the starry heavens that we can work with on our plants. And this might look like this in our calendar. So we can see here, I'll do my best here, but you can see this is a fruit in this red. We have these different fruit periods here and here, right? So that's when we know we want to we plant a, um, a tomato or, or a fruit tree if you're working with apples or pears or any of the fruits. Ideally, you'd work with them on, a, on the moons in that sign. And then you see these other times, like here. You see this blackout area? It's like in, in gray. And there's another big one right here. Those are the times if you plant seeds, you're probably going to have insect infestations. You're probably going to have disease. You're not, probably not going to have a very healthy plant. So there's times that are good and times that are not so good. And so you can see this. We're making this... Um, here, as we're going through, we're going from a, a fruit constellation into an earth constellation, into a flower, into our water. So, so say you were planting cannabis out there, you're, you're out in your hemp field, and you plant your seeds on a, on a leaf day. Well, in the end, you're probably not going to have the best looking flowers. You're going to have a more leafy plant. Um, <clears throat> so that you can pay attention to these rhythms and find out, like right down here at the 31st, um, they're right before Good Friday, you know, like if, you, if I was planting, uh, you know, you can look at two to three days, we got it before the full moon, we've got a nice fruit period in here, but then we have this dark out period, we have the beautiful flower period up here. So there's certain times for all these activities. So, this is, here, let's go back, let's see. Oops, what in the world? <laughs> well, very special thanks to the parent. We didn't really need to talk about the other stuff anyways. But just needless to say <laughs> that there are certain times that we can pay attention to. This calendar is an excellent resource. So you guys can go up to Earth Friendly and get this. You can get this at other um, Farm and Home probably has these this year. I'm not sure. Um, I'll be teaching a class on this, these calendars coming up. But <clears throat> absolutely fascinating to uh, plant these seeds and find out What's happening when? Let's see, let me go back. How about that? This is an interesting little device. This is a this is a new stirring device. This is a sacred energy chi generator. Basically, this is a water implosion device, and it's based on the sacred geometry form of the left ventricle of the human heart, where the where the blood's spiraling in one direction, it's spiraling out the other direction. The heart's not really a pump, you know. It's actually this this incredible vortex. It's happening here. So this is actually mimicking that and it creates, so I've got this last year, I've been using it a lot, and it basically, any fertilizer I put in there and mix it with water, it increases its efficacy by at least 10, you know, 10 times. So I can use 10 times less fertilizer and have the same results. Um, I started a company called uh, Biodynamic Source to, to have, the, we have these different remedies available. Um, there's, there's a great company called uh, jo Josephine Porter Institute, they're out of Virginia. I think uh, Pat's out there somewhere in the audience, but you can talk with her. They have, uh, they make all these remedies. That's where I originally learned how to make, make a lot of these. Um, there's a great product called the Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer products. There's the field spray and the um, compost starter. And those are some of the easiest ones to use. So you can find those, I think, again, at Farm and Home or, or talk to Pat back there. Great way to get these preparations out. And, there's our beautiful vortex again, and I wanted to give a very special thanks to the Paradise Theater and all these fine folks here. I'd really like to thank Aaron for his, um, his help, and Jim, you're great for getting help me get set up here, IT, technical assistance. Um, is, I don't know if Amy DeLuca is in the house, but I would like to thank her. For, she, she is the one who really originally got me out here to speak a couple years ago at the Paradise. Help that go up. And I would really love to thank uh, the Valley Organic Growers Association and the Learning Council. You ladies are great. And all the board of directors, anybody who's here from those organizations, Jim, uh, thanks for your help. And you guys made this possible. I really appreciate it. And um, I think now would be if you guys want, you can ask me some questions. We've got a little time. It's about, uh, it's about 17 after 8, so we have a few minutes. I'm, I'm sure there's a few maybe burning questions out there. We did have a mic set up if you want to 
ask anything. Um, you... So if you were if you were working on transplanting like a bare root tree or some berry cuttings or some grape cuttings or propagating some perennials like cutting and dividing some comfrey. Would you want to focus that on a root day or would you want to focus that on your um, outcome of the plant like a leaf or a root? That's a great question. Very good question. <laughs> when we have, um, so I always find my earth signs, the, the Taurus and the Virgo, you know, the thick earth signs, those are all, there's such a, there's such a great quality there that's gonna increase the health of your, your roots. Um, so anytime you're transplanting, you can always use the earth days as a default. And if you wanna get very specific, like valerian, you know, in the end goal, I might be looking for the valerian root or the valerian flower, depending. So you can, you can definitely choose, um, you can definitely go for the specific plant at a specific time what you want, but you can always go back to the earth signs. Like even if like I'm planting seeds, I will I'll always tailor back to the earth signs if I don't have a, the other signs that I need. Like if I'm looking for echinacea, and I'm going for the flower, but I don't have any time, I will certainly use those earth signs. So the, uh, <clears throat> now um, taking cuttings, there's a, couple other, there's a couple other rhythms. There's this whole ascending and descending moon which is not the new moon, full moon rhythm, it's a completely different rhythm as this, you know, the sun makes this arc in the sky. And in spring uh, equinox, in the, uh, or the, in the fall, autumnal equinox, it's, the sun's rising directly east and setting due west. But in the summer, it's setting northeast, or it rises northeast and sets northwest. And in the, in the winter, it's a very short, you know, it's a southeast and southwest. So it's making a small arc and then every day, the sun's getting a little bit bigger till we get to the midpoint of the summer, and then it starts making a smaller arc. And this, when the arc starts getting smaller every day, it's actually this energetic quality is going into the ground, so that is the very best time to do your prunings and stuff. This happens every two weeks with the moon, instead of a whole year with uh, six months on either side with the sun. So if you take, if you prune fruit trees, which everybody's gonna prune fruit trees, right? But if you prune when, that, when, when the moon's ascending every day, you actually, the sap, it, you know, you can, all that energy is like going out and you cut it and trees bleed and they're not as happy, but if you can cut them when the, when the descending moon, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Matt, you had a question earlier. Do you want to? When, when you're fermenting plants for your preparations, mm -hmm. Is it just the straight plant, or are you adding any sort of thing to assist or aid fermentation? Oh, that's a great question. So when we're fermenting plants, are we adding anything to, the, to that to help ferment? Sugar or whatnot? So there's a whole, um, well, there's a great science in, in behind that with the Korean natural farm. I don't know how many of you guys know about that, but the Korean, there's this guy who went around and studied the best of all the oriental wisdom he could find, best of all the teachers from Japan and China and Korea and Thailand. He went around and studied all of them. And he basically realized, you know, there's all these guys, they love the ferments, the kimchi and all that. But so he started fermenting um, all kinds of things with sugar, brown sugar in particular. And that is extremely effective. And so one of the things he came up with was like, you know, any of your medicinal plants, like say comfrey this time of year or coming up soon, um, <clears throat> nettles, you can use marigolds, you can use almost all kinds of different plants. You can use medicinal herbs um, for their qualities, angelica. Um, but you take them, those new fresh shoots and you actually chop them and you mix them 50-50 with brown sugar and you get this what's called fermented fruit juice. There's also a fermented uh, plant juice, or a fermented plant juice, and there's a fermented fruit juice where you add layers of, um, you know, fruit with the brown sugar, and you come and you get that. That's a highly effective remedy for uh, your spray. So you use tiny amounts of that, but this is a great way to add fertility. So in general, like in the in the biodynamic equisetum tea I use, I make a tea. I, you need to boil that. It needs to be boiled for about at least 20 minutes to extract the qualities of it. So that one, generally I just ferment by itself. Now it's the same way. But then you, you, can, you can definitely add other stuff like the effective microorganisms or uh, like that barrel compost I show you is, is, is an excellent uh, thing to add to any of your ferments to help it digest and break down quicker. When do you boil the uh, at what stage? 
So I like to get it um, um, pretty much any time after the equisetum plants have gotten about like nine inches tall. And after, and, I, and I'll make a tea out of it all the way until um, maybe August. And then the plants start to die down and come back. But then, you know, there, there's, now some say there might be a higher silica quality towards the end of the season. So you, you cut them and you make the tea, you let it, let it soak in the water, mm -hmm. and then you boil it? So what I do is actually take the water and I'll bring it to a, um, like a simmer, and I'll add my herb in there, and I'll let it, Bring then bring it to a boil and I like let it simmer at a low boil for about 20 minutes, and then I just let that. Then I cool that, and I like to leave that plant matter in there to, to do its deal. Um, and then ideally, you put that into like the uh, an earthenware crock or um, uh, you know plastic buckets work fine, but it, you know root cellar type conditions, cool, dark, and and that that's really that's when you can get the best the best characteristic smell and and. And it's super effective. And it's interesting, you can use the fresh tea of the equisine and the horsetail herb, and it'll treat about a about one cup of the fresh herb in water will treat an acre. But if you ferment it, one cup of the fresh tea may turn into a ferment, will treat three acres. So it comes like three times more potent. So um, super economical again. And then you always stir it before you I always it. stir it to oxygenate it, re-enliven it. And you know, this whole stirring process we were showing you, you create this vortex in one direction, and then you get that chaos going, and then you switch direction, you create the chaos and the vortex in the other direction, and you're energizing the water, you're enlivening the water. I mean, you think about the water is the most alive, it's, when it's flowing, it's gurgling over the brooks, over the stones, it's all this oxygenation, so this whole process of enlivening the water, so again, you're actually adding energetic qualities to it. You're welcome. Can you just talk a little bit about the hand stirring? Oh yeah, sure, sure. So yeah, that machine. I have a couple machines for it. Do it because I do work with some larger acreage, um, acreage farms, and uh, and and hand stirring is, is a lot to do. But easily to do by hand. You you we do this in a five gallon bucket. Works really good with like three gallons of water, and so that it's highly effective for your you know trans transferring the qualities of those different remedies into into that water and the water becomes that carrier spray that out so that one is stirred um i love stirring it's it's a beautiful exercise and it, and it's kind of like a meditation i always like stir towards my heart bring one in one the other and then if you ever come um i'm sure we'll teach this at some point and we all we usually do is um some of enzo nastati's methods are um you can take these and you can actually do this homeopathic stirring with this whole uh, 72 degrees, 70, 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 72 beats per minute. There's like a specific homeopathic colonization, but you can also stir that way, and that's another way to get the uh, to get these qualities out, but really quickly, like in one minute. It's a one minute process. So he's all about making it cheap and economical, um, and and it's highly effective. I've I've had a really good result. I think most of the, our Valer our Valerian sprays always get pre-potentized before we put them out. How would you spray it out by hand if you didn't have a spray nozzle? Right, so there's uh, the backpack sprayer works really good if you if you can get one of those. And I always like to strain my stuff. And I don't. You guys probably uh, you've seen the five gallon bucket paint strainers. They're like they're like poly sacks um, that they sell for straining paint straining paint through. But you can use those to strain whatever's going through the backpack sprayer, and it'll get all the junk out. And it's only they're like fifty cents each, so it's super econo economical way to do that. But then, you know, a lot of people will see, looks like they're out sprinkling holy water, you just like kind of flick it out, and that works really good too. Um, when you just said that, um, a paintbrush. A paintbrush works paint good. Paint Thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah. Leaves. Leaves work good. I like to use uh, branches from the pine trees or something. That works really good. Sure did, sure did uh, get my neighbor's water. <laughs> <laughs> well, always, I mean, this is such like a... Such our a yard, she's out here and she's got this bucket and she's walking around the edge. What are you doing? Well, I get that question a lot. <laughs> yeah, you got any more questions after Zoe? Do you have yeah. questions? Is there a biodynamic farm to get vegetables, at least like a produce place here in Paleo? Well, Zephyros Farms uses the preparations. Um, I know uh, Chloe, what's the name of your Happy Belly CSA? She, she uses the preps out there. 
Uh, let's see, who else? I know there's got to be a bunch of people else am I missing? Jeff needs a small potato. Jeff Schwartz, small potatoes for sure. Jeff Schwartz at Delicious Orchards. I spray there quite often. Uh, you might see me during the spray, during the grow season, <laughs> out there spraying. The way you might even get a big dose of prep if you're near, nearby. Spray it on you. Um, there's. Yeah, Lamborn Mesa Farm up at um, Carol Schott's place. She doesn't really have much in the way of vegetables, but she does have the lavender. I think there's a number of farms too, small homesteads that are using the preparations. There's more people coming on. I mean, there's, vitamin, there's certified vitamin alcohol. Now the, the distillery up in Redlands Mesa is absolutely fascinating for people who do drink or make tinctures or anything because that is high quality stuff, you know. And, and Lance, there was a fascinating, um, <clears throat> so last year, um, Enzo again, he gave us this indication. He said, if you spray, uh, when the moon and the sun are in Taurus, You'll have for you'll have nitrogen for the whole year because if you look at all those different constellations in the zodiac, they're all related to different elements. So you can actually. Um, so he said, if you spray, spray your your manure preparations when the moon and sun are in Taurus. So we tried this on this on this vineyard vineyard, and he has this patch. I wish he was here tonight to talk about this, but this patch of vines, uh, this this whole great area. I don't know how many acres, but he's it's been planted for a number of years, and he's. It's always been yellow. It's always, he said, it's the worst plot he's ever had. So we sprayed when the moon and sun were in Taurus last year, which was like in May. And sure enough, he said, that is the most beautiful, healthiest patch of grapes he has in the entire place. And so there's, there's these things work, you know, it's work, it's about timing. You know, a lot about this is, um, you know, we have lots of tools for farming. We have tons of tools. And these preparations, these remedies we're talking to you about tonight are just a few more things to add to your toolbox. When you need something, you know, you need something else to break out because the insects are getting too bad. You have a severe drought. I mean, we're looking at a serious, you know, this, this might be a serious year here in this valley. This might be the worst drought year we've experienced in, in a generation or more, you know. But if you look at the numbers of, uh, if we don't get some snow, it's going to be intense. So, um, Things could dry up really quickly, so using these preparations will help, you know. It, it's fascinating, if you find out in biodynamics, if you look when biodynamics shines, it's not in the good years, it's not when everything's like good for the plants, you know, and everything's, you know, the, everybody does good in the good years, but in the bad years, it's when the bio, that's when the biodynamics just keeps riding, you know, just keeps riding high, and everybody else is, you know, experiencing more, more problems, the bio, those remedies that I was just talking about will will give your soils a, a, you know, a nice, strong, healthy boost, and your roots will go down deeper. You'll have more water retention. You'll have more earthworm activity. You'll have more life. And so these are keys. These are keys. I'll pick one back here, Pat. Can you talk a little bit about, for people who haven't used this, these techniques before, like a, a basic starting point? Mm -hmm. Good question. What would you start with and why if you were just starting? I think a, there's a few there's a few easy things to start with. Like the company that um, Pat, she's the director, is the president of the board of directors of the, the Institute for Applied Biodynamics, and they make this product called the, the field spray and the compost starter. And I was telling you about those, but they are basically <coughs> um, probably one of the easiest ways to get started because those products contain you know, a huge amount of, they have all the biodynamic preparations in them, but they also have beneficial uh, fungi, bacteria, microbes. So those are real easy, those are available. I would say that, that's a good place to start. I think um, the nettle and equisetum teas are like two of the easiest. Those grow around here abundantly. They're cheap, cheap and easy to make. Um, so those are, those are great ways to start. You know, we have, uh, we have a pretty strong biodynamic community here. I was actually farming out in Hawaii um, I had a great job on um, managing an organic farm out there. When I found this community out here, I came up to teach at a conference, and I, I kind of fell in love with you guys pretty quickly. I think I remember one night there was a there was a dance party right here in the paradise, and it was like the most I like had a spiritual experience seeing all these you know Paeonians like at their best with like this, these great 
<laughs> he was, man. So we, but you know, this is special here because we have a very strong biodynamic community. And if you look around, well, if I looked around, I see New York and Hudson Valley and California and a couple little places in Oregon. There's these little tiny pockets where, where you know, biodynamics is, is really taking a stronghold and, and they're having incredible results with it. And so this is a place where we have lots of, uh, we have a really strong community around biodynamics. So we have, um, you know, classes here. Pat herself is an incredible resource. If you guys ever have questions, she is like, she's a biodynamic genius. She's been doing it for a long time, here longer than anybody else, I think, in this whole area. So great resource. I teach classes to, um, I teach a lot of classes over in Carbondale over in sustainable settings, but we just put some of those plants right in the grounds and start setting them into a plot, such as a nettle, such as dandelion, Mm -hmm. And then let that go on because we don't have the room for cow plants, for example. Right. So how how can you bring that in? In a related question, if you don't have those plants available and wildcraft them, if you were to go to an herb store and, and buy nettle, dry nettle, would that be the same, or have you lost your life force by not harvesting wild plants? You know, I think um, we can. You can definitely get the, the herbs. Like right now, my we have one of the biodynamic remedies is chamomile. And right now, that's the one I'm not growing. It's the only one of the plants that I'm buying in. So I'm definitely buying that one in. I don't have enough chamomile to make my, my remedies. So sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do for sure. So I think the nettles, I've bought nettles before. I've actually bought dandelions. I was actually gonna make a point when I had that picture up, but I forgot all about those dandelions. But um, have you guys ever driven out in Matthews Lane in spring and seen those orchards and it's nothing but fields of dandelions? Do you know how much dandelion blossoms go for? $50 a pound. $50 a pound. So there is like thousands and thousands of pounds just in the one orchard out there. So you can, um, so you want to get good high quality dandelion blossoms because they do start to go to seed really quickly so you kind of got to pick them early. Um, <clears throat> So I think, you know, the nettle grows here wild, the equisetum, the valerian we do plant, um, the oats you can get wild, the manure is pretty easy to come by. Um, so do what you can, when you can, is, is the best, best thing I can say. And I think um, in, your, in, your, in, in your plots, like your garden plots, I think having these plants around are extremely beneficial. They're all very beneficial companion plants too, so using them. Um, you know, having, you know, leaving some dandelions to go to seed and do their thing, having valerian growing, you know, get some comfrey going, getting all, you know, start slow, but getting, getting these things going and then, and then start spraying. It's amazing when you start spraying what starts to happen because the energetic quality on your land changes and people start to notice, you know, that something's going to shift. There's going to be a shift happening and, and um, you know, if you're sensitive, you can, a lot of times you can feel that. Um, so I would say, you know, it's important to, to, to get started and try to make, you know, get the nettles and get the aquasiums out there and you can come to one of, you know, we, we have these preps available locally um, and you can also buy, buy them from a few different places too, so uh, that's a great place to start. Claire? Where are you Well, so I have them online, so you can order, but also Earth Friendly Supply has, um, has the, the vitamin preps available. There's a great remedy called a tree paste that is another biodynamic remedy we use for, for uh, vineyards and orchards and it's basically, um, it's done a cheap and easy one to make. Super effective though. You can actually rejuvenate uh, tree trunks and it's, you know, it's almost like putting a salve on your skin, it, but it's the it's clay, cow manure, and silica. And then you can add different teas, like you can add equisetum tea or nettle tea. And you can add your manure preparations in there, and you and you make this, uh, <coughs> you blend it all up, and you make it into a paste, and you can paint the tree trunks with it. And what happens is that you know you've seen trees that are all gnarly and cracked and broken, or have insects or borers in them, or you pruned and they have a nasty wound on them, or something's cracked. And you can put that tree paste on it, and within like a year of, of applying this, you'll see this goes from these really rough, you know, tree trunks to something that's uh, it's, it's almost like it's. Uh, 
it's super soft and smooth, like it, it changes the structure. So it's rejuve, it's actually benefit, it's putting, um, it's fertilizing the cambium layer of the tree, which most people don't think that's even possible, but it actually fertilizes right through the cambium. Yes? So we have some elm trees that are, oh, yeah. that are doing that drooping thing. Mm -hmm. Is this something you treat them with? Or well, that's, Yeah, that is a that's a nasty little issue that the elves just seem to have, where they bleed the white <laughs> goo out. <laughs> you know, the, the elves are such a hardy tree that they just keep growing no matter what. So it's good to um, I've tree pasted it. I've tried. I haven't had much luck with um, getting rid of it. So that was one. <clears throat> I, I think we slowed it down a little bit, and I think we've increased the overall health of those trees. But it was such an amazing tree. And a lot of people hate them. But you know, you think about it's, it's it's a survivor, it's a thriver. So I think um, it's good to treat those trees if you can. And then there's also like you can dilute that highly, and you can spray it on the trees too. So I'll spray trees with this with with that. Question in the back. Are you doing any trials on that on uh, emerald ash borer anywhere? The emerald ash borer. I'm not doing any it's trials, to but there's. Out every, every ash tree in the you know, I just had this. Um, I was just back on the East Coast, and where, where I grew up in these, uh, in, in, and there's this thing called the, the hemlock woolly adelgid. And we had this beautiful, like when I was growing up, there's this sacred grove of these hemlocks. It's the most beautiful thing you could imagine. You can go in there, and you can enter, you can just feel the majesty of these trees <laughs> in that space. And I just went. I was just there a couple weeks ago, and <clears throat> this hemlock woolly adelgid came through there, and it's destroyed every single hemlock in the entire forest around there. And it was like so sad to see this happen. So this is something we're contending with now. Like, you know, Mother Nature is on this decline spiral. I mean, we have more pollution. We have all this stuff. The Earth is like in this actual, you know, it's kind of dying off. You know, we're, it's, it's, there's a lot going on. If you think about all the fracking, all the, all the oil, all the, you know, the gas, the pollution, all this other, all this negative stuff that's going on. And we're seeing whole species of trees, you know, I mean, I'm thinking about the hemlocks in my lifetime, my short little lifetime, I've seen a tree that was thriving, almost non-existent in the forest down there. So, so there's, there's some things, there's a gentleman by the name of Hugh Courtney, who uh, Pat knows well too, but, but he has these different, he makes these different, uh, they're biodynamic remedies for these pests. So basically you're taking the pests, like the emerald ash borer, and you're burning that at a specific time when the moon's on the right side, and you're spraying that back out, and it's almost like spraying the death force. So he's actually been able to use these. He's made one for the hemlock woolly adelgid, and they're, the trees are thriving that get sprayed with this because it's um, the plant, you know, that, that quality that that insect is trying to, you know, get in there. You know, the insects are messengers telling us there's something going on, something's wrong here. So we, we're really good at killing the messenger a lot of times, but this guy is making all these different remedies, and they're available, and they're like, you know, $4. You can get. So I don't know if he has the ash for it yet, but he could definitely, if we can, if we can collect some of them, he can make a remedy for it. It's extremely economical. What about citrus greening? What would they'll stop after that? Well, I think that would be the um, equisetum. It's one of the number one things you can do to boost the health of any kind of uh, fungus. That's a fungal disease, right? Yeah. But a couple, May. Huh. Lloyd, um, I wanted to give you a report on the paste. Okay. I used it on my leaking birch tree. And wherever I put it in the fall, I just checked them yesterday, and it stopped all that runny. It's just hard to reach all the places of the tree, mm -hmm. you know, that's damaged. But where I was able to reach and then just put on that paste, totally dried it up. It was wonderful. Um, so it works. It does. It definitely the tree paste works really good, um, and it and it definitely. Uh, I've seen several trees that are saved from using it, for sure. Hello. I have a quick question. Um, yep. You're making the barrel compost in the horns. Does it matter how fresh or composted the manure is? Oh, that's a great question. So there's a question about the, uh, the uh, how fresh a manure we want to use. We like it fresh. We like it still steaming. We like it warm. So we're going to check it out. Uh, now, the fresher, the better, I think, especially with the, with the horns. You want to get like the best quality you can, so you're looking for a lactating cow. You're looking for a cow that's already had a couple calves, ideally not a bull. There's like, you know, there's old saying, no bullshit, biodynamics. So it's, it's, a, it's a female cow. 
Uh, this year we actually used buffalo buffalo manure um, on a few different of our things. And that's a lot of fun. So any any of the bovine species, but that's it is important to use fresh. You know, because stuff starts to, as long as it stays out in the sun, you're losing nitrogen, you're losing some of those elements, so it is good to use really good fresh quality. And there's a few, there's a few um, dairies, a couple places that have um, cows around here that are really good, healthy cows. Uh, the Von Gontards up on their dairy have really, really good, their shit's really good. And then they're over, uh, there's the, you know, there's Lamb Born Mesa Farmstead, they have, you know, they're really good. They have really good manure, so there's a few places to get that. So since it's fresh, you don't have to add liquid to it? You can add tea to it later, like whenever you spray it? Yeah, so we, we basically we're not adding, we usually don't add much to these when we're, when we're making them. So, like the manure, we stir it for an hour before it ever gets put into the horn or into the barrel compost. But we're never really adding much except for those medicinal herbs into the, into the preps. Until it gets diluted and stirred and sprayed, that's when it's finished. Okay. That's okay. Do you just use water to make the quartz paste? I use water. This year I actually used um, Equisetum tea because it's the horse tail is the silica. You know, so I used the horse tail tea with my silica. So it's like a plant based silica and a mineral silica. Yeah, any more questions? We maybe take one more and then we should call it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question Yeah. ask you after also. Go ahead. Okay, so I don't have farmland, mm -hmm. yet I'm really inspired to be doing something on my land that can make a difference in the town. Mm -hmm. It's 40 acres, and um, but I'm off the grid, so I don't, like, I'm not planning to have a garden mm -hmm. or, or uh, mm -hmm. anything, and, and, I, and all I have is rainwater. So is there something that I can put on my land that could actually Add, add to this community because my land is, 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 is like alive to something. Sure. Um, I think, you know, the, in, in Steiner's uh, agriculture course, he said that, you know, the most important thing is that the benefits of these agricultural preparations get spread over the entire earth. So I spray a lot, like in uh, Carbondale, Aspen area, I spray a lot of landscapes. And so, you know, just with their, with their, uh, evergreens or their, uh, you know, their trees and, you know, their flowers, whatnot. So it definitely, like wherever you can use the preparations, it helps. And then there's also uh, tree treatments that you can actually treat trees that they become broadcasters of this energetic quality. That's a lot. That's a really fun thing to do. Well, basically what I have is I have juniper and sage. Mm -hmm. and Lots of it. <laughs> right. So then you'd like want to find your mother tree out there, you know, like is there one juniper out there that's like the big mama tree that's really healthy and you know, you could find those trees if you ever look out in nature, you can find those big trees and, and those are the those are the really ones that <laughs> you can have a big effect on a large area by, by working with that. And that's the thing about biodynamics is it works not, you know, we're working on a physical level, like with the, the microbiology, um, fungal bacteria, soil food web. Then we have this whole energetic quality that it's increasing the life force, the vitality, the health. And, and you, that's, I mean, that's the ultimate. It's like we're trying to eat this food because if you eat this food that's been charged up with these different remedies, it actually affects you. It affects you on a, on a, on a spiritual level that you become more uh, in tune with the greater surroundings around you. And it, more in tune with, you know, maybe called the spiritual world or the heavens or whatever. You know, you could just never, you know, we can name this numerous different things in different religions and different times and spaces. But um, the, <clears throat> the gist of it is that getting this, these remedies out there is really powerful for the earth. And if you can eat that food, it really will make a difference in you. And that's the ultimate goal is to become, you know, we've, uh, you know, we've seen this decline when, when every, you know, when Zarathustra came to teach agriculture 10,000 years ago, and he brought that whole, you know, start, start the first breeding of the plants and the first breeding of the animals and all those things. And they were connected, you know, that was like the star wisdom. And, and through the, you know, the Egyptians, if you look at their culture, they, they were connected with the heavens. And, and, and they knew all about the signs of the zodiac and all that. And then you go to the Greece times, and they kind of went down to the planetary system. And, you know, now, now like in our, in our times, like most people are just as far as, you know, paying attention to the moon. Like conventional agriculture doesn't even pay attention to the moon anymore. But now we are at this point where we have to reverse this cycle 
to where, you know, once we were connected to the heavens and we've come to this density, and now we have this chance to either evolve, you know, and, and grow forward, or we can keep from this devolution. And, and um, it's kind of a serious matter there. <laughs> So these are these are tools, you know. These are tools to regenerate the earth, and um, regenerate the soils, and to really leave something for the future. To leave something, you know, if we want to have a healthy uh, future for our kids and our farmlands, if we can use these different remedies out there to increase that soil and the health. I mean, think about um, think about these deserts, these vast deserts, and if you can create fertility where there's not, you're creating something amazing here, and so. And they're simple, you know, we're using the, we're using less than, you know, a couple pounds over the whole season, you know, a couple handfuls of this stuff per acre. It's very, uh, you know, uh, minute quantities, but they have very <coughs> high powered effects. I mean, you think about like, you know, you know, we, it's easy to think, oh, how could something so small have such an effect? Think about nuclear fission. Think about the amount of, you splitting that atom, how much energy that has on this energetic quality. So. All these remedies are made to, um, to, you know, to bring that life into your plants. And it's fascinating. You start using them, you'll start to see your plants waking up, your soils, the earthworm. You're going to see, you know, I had this friend we sprayed over there, and he's like, the owls came in the next day, and the hawks, and they're all hanging out. You know, all these, these, these things happen. And, um, and the thing is, it works. And I wouldn't be up here telling you guys about this. I mean, I farmed in North Carolina and Kentucky and Hawaii and Tennessee, uh, out here in Colorado, and I've seen over and over this stuff works. And so I am, uh, I'm really passionate about uh, bringing this work forward. And I know we have fertile ground here for this. We have such a, uh, a strong and beautiful community that's really uh, supports this work here. So we are, we are really blessed that we're in a good space. And uh, with that, I'm gonna. Say thank you all so much for coming out. Yeah. I really appreciate it.